see, the story is called Lat Yom. Now, Lat Yom is a Khasi word which means where the hills are set free. And it's basically one of those places which is slightly outside Shillong. So you get there on a motorbike, you feel all cool and you're driving down these open roads. And you get to this place and it literally is the head of the valley. And so you're looking down at this sort of rolling hills that just go on and on forever and you feel like you've reached the end of the world and this is it. In front of you, there are only mountains and nothing else. Um, so it's, it's this sense of escape and sort of, um, you know, quiet joy that I tried to capture in the story. And it's told through the eyes of this young girl who has an elder sister who's really quite um, cool, unlike her. Every other day, the world ended, often within our house rather than on the streets of Shillong. Out there, it was a riot between the outsiders and the locals. Yet what troubled my parents through the early 90s, more than the antics of insurgency groups and the government, were the shenanigans of my elder sister, Grace. She was 17 and as unfathomable to them and to me as the stars. I was 12, gawky, awkward, and dreaming of the day I'd perhaps turn out like her effortlessly beautiful, so infinitely comfortable within her own skin, so shockingly bold. I loathe you was her standard response to any rules my parents enforced, which, to be fair, covered an alarmingly wide number of things. No late nights, no parties, no boys coming over, no alcohol, no going over to boys' houses, no smoking, no torn jeans, no hanging around on the streets of Lankra, and so on. So Grace casually flouted them all, some at the same time. My sister's friends were all the popular kids, the athletic basketball stars and pretty girls, the ones invited to all the parties who played guitar and smoked real cigarettes, not the sweet phantom ones I puffed on cold winter evenings and then exhaled pretending my foggy breath was smoke. Her friends streamed in and out of the house like a colorful exotic parade and I kept out of their way while desperately longing to be included. In those days, and I'm sure we've all had parties like this at some point, my sister's parties were held during the afternoon, the curtains drawn to create the illusion of night, shaken Stevens booming out of tinny Phillips speakers, and gold spot and thumbs up slugged out of dusty glass bottles. If the drinks were spiked, which I'm sure they were, it was done with the utmost discretion. I wasn't allowed into the room, but wandered in from time to time with messages from my mother regarding the volume of the music or the lateness of the hour. And nobody seemed to notice I was there, lost as they were in each other's arms, floating around to air supply. There wasn't much to choose from, I decided, between this one and the one imagined, until Chris, came over to our house one evening. Chris belonged to Shillong's oldest, wealthiest Chinese family who'd immigrated to the hills from Calcutta in the 60s. The first time I saw him, he roared up on a Yamaha, helmet in hand, leather jacket in the other, and I thought he was the hippest person I'd ever laid eyes on. On his back was a guitar case, casually slung across as though it weighed no more than a feather. I saw my sister's face when she was introduced to him. I don't know how to describe it, except I've never seen that, her look at with, that way at anyone. I'm a guitarist in a band, he said, flicking back his dark, spiky hair. I'm on lead. My brother, Melvin, is on drums. When they entered our living room, I heard Chris rifle through Grace's cassettes and say, Air Supply, Foreigner, Rock Set. You listen to rubbish. <laughs> Have you heard Hendrix? That evening, all that drifted through the door was the electrified twang of a guitar and a husky voice singing songs I didn't know. It was music I'd never heard before. Angry, raspy sounds that emerged from inexplicable rage. From then on, my sister and Chris were inseparable. They tore around on his motorbike paying little heed to reports of trouble, 
growing ever since the government had refused to meet with the insurgency groups for talks. I don't know if my parents noticed, but Grace changed in these months. She dressed differently, in darker, more grown-up clothes. She let her hair hang loose and tangled. She took down the posters of Debbie Gibson and Jason Donovan in her room and replaced them with the ones Chris gave her. Hendrix, Led Zeppelin, The Who, Jethro Tull, The Beatles. What's happened to you? My mother once asked in exasperation. My sister smiled. I discovered rock and roll. <laughs> the clearest memory I have of Chris and his brother is when we all went to Lat Lome. Let's go for a drive, said Chris. In those days, when Shillong had no fancy cafes, restaurants, gaming parlors, or shopping malls, drive was a magical word. It offered time away, however briefly, from a small town filled with people you knew or who knew your parents. Drives were an escape. And on that particular afternoon, against our parents' orders, I could hear them gathering their things. I had never been on a drive or been invited to one either. Let's take her. I looked up. They were on their way out and Chris was gesturing at me. What? No, said my sister immediately. Come on, I held my breath. She's been stuck at home too. There was little she could say no to when it came to Chris. She can ride with Mel, she said grudgingly. They say you don't ever forget your first love, your first kiss. I don't know if it applies to your first motorbike ride. It didn't change my life, but it gave me the first tremulous hint of how things could be different. That there were other ways of experiencing the world. So far, for me, that had been from the security of being on the inside a car, a book, the judicious guidance of my parents, cocooned in plastic and metal, in parched pages, within the arms of a suffocating love. And everything goes by, scenery and life, unfurling at a safe and careful distance, a flat, democratic haze. Being outside is a step away from safety. On a motorbike, the world rushes up at you from all sides. So do the wind and the colors of the trees and the sky. You are exposed. The sunshine hits your back, your face. The air flies down your throat. And you are nothing but a single glorious movement.